hey folks, uh, it's probably kind of different to see me without a mask. Um, so this is Dr. Gilchrist, and I am recording just a little bit of our short-term and working memory lecture so that you uh, can get a little bit more today because we spent a lot of time focusing on uh, the George Sperling study. I plan to have that data collected for you by Monday. If you have not sent that to me yet, please get it to me as soon as possible. Um, I did kind of run through the YouTube video of the live stream. You should be able to see the letters there. So if you haven't gotten that data to me, do it soon. It's a homework assignment. You need to get it in. So um, I want to bring up a point that was raised at the very end of class. So I brought up this question. Do you think there's a difference between the memory of your first day of school and the memory of um, what I might have just said a few seconds ago. Um, and what we tend to find is that most people have an intuition that there is a difference between memories that are older and are longer lasting uh, versus memories for things that have most recently occurred maybe within the past minute, maybe two tops. And those intuitions seem to be correct. Now, obviously, we are talking about some theoretical constructs. Um, these are not things that actually exist, but what we do tend to find is that most cognitive researchers do believe that there is a distinction between short-term and long-term memory. Not everybody does, but most do. So this raises the notion of what we call separate stores, that we have a long-term memory storage area and we have a short-term memory storage area. And some of the pieces of evidence that we have for these separate stores come from the fact that short-term memory and long-term memory uh, not only have different capacity limits, but they also have differing durations. And these researchers that have found um, evidence for these different capacity limits and durations do support what we would call a multi-store model of memory. That means that we have separate memory stores for um, the different types of memories and durations that we are kind of working with. So probably the most famous multi-store model was provided by Atkinson and Schifrin in 1968. And we're going to talk about each of these um, in turn. Now, we're largely going to focus on short-term memory this week, but we do have to take some time to talk about our sensory stores because that's how information gets from, uh, or rather, that's how information gets into short-term memory. Um, so the multi-store model kind of works like this. Um, so information is basically coming to us through our senses in a variety of different ways. Um, by and large, this will occur through uh, our vision. This will occur at a secondary level through our hearing and then at a tertiary level uh, through our touch. Um, there is technically a sensory memory for every type of sense, but we have a tendency to focus on visual and auditory more because we use those most. Um, so we have all of these different things that are out in our world that we can experience with our senses. Now, we're only going to pay attention to some of those, but we need to process changes in our vision and in our hearing to be able to navigate our world. And that's why um, sensory memory can be so critical. It's what helps us notice change. Um, we're going to only pay attention to some of the information that's out there in the world reaching our sensory memory. The information that is attended to gains access to short-term memory. Now, one of the things that we're going to learn about short-term memory is that it's very, very limited in terms of its capacity. It can't really hold a lot. One of the things we'll find about our sensory memory is that it can hold a lot, but short-term memory really can't. And so what this means is that not everything that gains access to short-term memory will have the opportunity to uh, gain access to long-term memory. And oftentimes what we'll find is that if too much information is trying to get into short-term memory, something is going to have to get bumped out. The technical term that we use for this is displacement. And basically, once you're out of short-term memory, well, you're lost forever at that point. 
Um, now, for some of the information that we have in our short-term memory, we are going to need that for later. Atkinson and Chipper proposed that one of the ways that we do this is through a process of rehearsal. So we repeat an item to ourselves over and over and over again. And by doing that, we gain access to long-term memory. Now here's what's really critical. Information and long-term memory, um, we're not actually sure that it ever really goes away. So once something's in long-term memory, technically it can never be lost. We believe that the storage there is somewhat permanent, um, barring instances of dementia, brain damage, cortical atrophy, etc. But items compete with each other for retrieval. And so what we're going to find is that a lot of our retrieval from long-term memory is subject to interference. Now that's not saying that it's lost from that store, but rather it's not accessible at this particular moment in time. So this is the basic idea of how the multi-store model works. It's very, very intuitive. It's very simple. Um, now, obviously, there are going to be some more complexities in this, but it's a very, very simple parsimonious model of how memory works. So we're going to start by briefly talking about sensory memory. So the sensory stores uh, basically exist to help you navigate the change in your world. So um, if you are walking around outside, you're gonna see a lot of different things moving and you're going to be moving through your environment. You need to have some sense of continuity. So um, for those of you that have had me for biopsych, you might have heard me talk about a disorder referred to as akinetopsia. Um, akinetopsia is a disorder in which somebody has damage to their medial temporal lobe um, and they basically do not perceive smooth motion. Everything looks like static snapshots from one frame to the next. There's no sense of continuity, there's no sense of smoothness, and that makes navigating daily life very difficult. You can argue that the sensory stores um, basically exist to help give your life a sense of continuity because as you move through the world, your senses are going to register change. So you need to be able to perceive those changes, but also very briefly keep track of what just came before so that you have that sense of continuity. That's true for our visual senses, and that's also true for speech. Um, so as I am making these noises with my mouth, I'm, I'm making speech, you do have to have some lingering memory of the speech sounds that I most recently made so that you can connect them to the sound that I am making right now. So you need to have that sense of continuity despite the fact that things are always changing. So we have a sensory store for every single one of our senses, and they have special names. So for our visual sensory memory, you will sometimes hear that referred to as iconic. Uh, for auditory, you will find that it gets referred to as echoic. And for touch, we tend to refer to it as haptic. Um, I will have to look and see what taste and smell are called because they tend to not get studied. One of the things that all of these have in common is that they have a very, very large capacity and they all have very, very short durations. And as I mentioned, the reason that these sensory uh, stores work the way they do is they give you a sense of continuity in a world where things are always changing. You need to be able to note those changes and you need to be able to connect them to the immediate past to have a sense of fluidity as you navigate your world. So one of the best ways that you can kind of see iconic memory in action is you can play with sparklers. Um, so the idea when you play with the sparkler, you trace images. So in this case, this person is tracing a heart. It's one of the easiest ways that you can see your iconic memory because for a very brief moment in time, you will see a shape that the tip of your sparkler makes. Now, let's be clear. The sparkler is not a line that one little point is all that is there. 
but you have a lingering memory of the of where the sparkler was and where that little point of light was immediately before. And that creates the heart shape that you see. Um, you have a little bit of a memory of where that sparkler previously was. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that if you very quickly stop tracing, the um, your image of that shape will fade. And so that's how you can also see not only your iconic memory, but how quickly the duration of it lasts. Now, one of the other things that you can kind of do, and sometimes I do this, is if I'm in a room that's not very brightly lit, this doesn't really work as well uh, when I'm under these bright fluorescent lights. Um, but if you're kind of in a dimly lit room, you can slowly raise and lower your hand. And if you're lucky, you might be able to see a fading trace of where your hand was. And that's how you notice your iconic memory. So how did we learn about the limits of sensory memory? We mostly learned about them by giving you that horrible experiment that I did today. Um, that was an original experiment uh, designed by George Sperling in 1960, looking at whole report for letters and partial report for letters. So just as a friendly reminder, whole report is when um, I present you with an array and I ask you to recall all of the items in any order from any row. Partial report occurs when I present you with an array, but then I tell you to only recall one of the rows at that time. So here's a quick little one. So in this demo, we have tones. The tones don't really work very well, so I'll skip them. So one of the things that we find when we look at this data, and we will check and see if your data actually matches up with that. Um, so one of the things that's interesting is that if you look at partial report, and most of you kind of indicated that you didn't do very well. But one of the things that you'll find is that most of you, and if I look through some of this, now obviously I haven't analyzed this data, I haven't taken an average of this data, but I am gonna look through, um, I am gonna look through your partial report and kind of see how many you're getting. Uh, a lot of threes, one, three, four, two, a lot of ones and twos, threes, ones, twos, four. Um, so what we're tending to find is that most of the time, so what we're tending to find is that most of you are at least getting about half of a row or you're grabbing something. So here's what's actually kind of interesting. So when most people do a whole report procedure, they usually get about four items, give or take. Um, here's what's interesting. Most people, when they do the partial report procedure, do also tend to get about three to four items. They get the whole, almost all of the whole row. Now here's what's really interesting. So you don't know ahead of time what row is going to be called. You don't know that until you hear that tone in the partial report procedure. So the reasoning behind this goes, that if I present that cue quickly enough, you can recall an entire row. And that's what Sperling actually found, that if he presented the tone quickly enough to indicate what cue or what row people were to recall, they could actually recall the whole row pretty well. But they didn't know which one they were gonna get ahead of time. Any of the rows were fair game. So Sperling reasoned that if you can recall the entire row, immediately after the queue, that must mean that at some point, the entire array must have been available to you. And so one of the things you kind of noted when we worked through, um, you may have noticed this when we worked through it, and I said, don't worry about multiplying it by three, was Sperling basically did multiply it by three, and here's why. Again, you don't know what you're gonna get ahead of time. There are three rows. If you can recall the whole row after the queue, that must mean that you had that entire row available and it probably means that you had the other ones available too because you didn't know what you were gonna get. And it turns out Sperling varied the time between when the array disappeared and the tone. And one of the things that you'll see is that in general, um, 
the more quickly that that tone was presented, the more that people could recall almost all of the entire array. As the delay between the disappearance of the array and the tone shifted to one second, um, people performance was basically no better than whole report. So um, basically what this means is that first of all, the duration of visual sensory memory is very short. Look at how quickly it drops in one second. Additionally, the capacity for visual sensory memory is very, very large. So that's what this means. So now we're going to move on and talk about short-term memory, which is by and large, um, it tends to be overlooked these days in light of working memory. Um, I have a tendency to use them interchangeably with people who may not be as familiar with working memory, um, but there are some pretty important differences. And you can decide for yourself whether or not you believe that short-term and working memory are the same or whether or not they are two separate things. So here are the basic properties of what people believed that short-term memory actually was. Um, people believed that short-term memory had a very, very limited capacity, far, far smaller than uh, visual sensory memory. It had a short duration. It's not as short as sensory memory, but it's still pretty short. And the original conception of short-term memory was that it basically functions as a temporary storage buffer. So it's basically kind of a halfway house between it's either going to end up in long-term memory or we're just going to hold on to it and then drop it and it's lost forever. So the idea is that it's kind of a temporary buffer, kind of the way that your internet browser stores uh, temporary internet files into its cache. So the idea is that... Um, the idea is that items here are temporary. They're not meant to stay here forever. They're basically either going to be go on to long-term memory or they're going to be lost forever. And what's really important here is that from this original perspective of short-term memory, it um, is very, very passive in its functioning. You cannot manipulate information um, within short-term memory according to this original idea. Um, you can't really do much with information in short-term memory. It's just there to be held until you lose it or use it for later or lose it forever. So one of the ways that researchers have tried to look at short-term memory is by testing digit span. So in this particular case, I give you some numbers. Do you remember the numbers that you just saw? So oftentimes what we'll do with digit span is we'll give people a list of numbers, either auditory or uh, visually, and then they simply have to repeat back what they heard in the order that they heard it or in the order that they saw it. So one of the first people to talk about capacity limits in uh, short-term memory was George Miller uh, in 1956. And he wrote a paper. Um, it was originally a talk he was invited to give at an annual meeting of the Eastern Psychological Association. Now, the story behind this talk is that... Um, he was invited to give this talk, and he didn't really have anything to talk about. And... Um, so he wrote a letter to the organizers of the meeting basically saying, I can't do this. I don't have any data. Um, and they basically told him, um, look, you took several pages to tell us no. Anybody who's going to write several pages of a letter saying why they can't do it must really, really want to do it. So Miller started looking at his data. And one of the things that he ended up finding is that he noticed a very weird uh, commonality in a lot of the data that he looked at. And one of the things that he found was that in a, in a variety of different tasks, there seemed to be a limit between five and nine items that could be recalled. And so Miller reported uh, all of this in a major paper called The Magical Number Seven Plus or Minus Two. Um, you can very easily find this article online. It's very easy to find. Um, and what, what's actually kind of interesting is that he believed 
he didn't actually know that there was truly a seven item limit. He believed it might have just potentially been a coincidence. Um, but he did note that in basic memory span tasks like the digit span task that I gave you, most people tend to recall between five and nine items. And also in what we call absolute judgment tasks, we also find very, very similar results. So in an absolute judgment task, um, you are given a line and it basically has some kind of length. And then you are given uh, other lines to basically compare it to. So line one, which is really short, uh, line two, which is a little less short, line three, which is even less short, and line four, which is really long. So you're given these comparison lines and you're basically like, okay, which one does this test line match? And Miller, once again, found that a similar number uh, tended to be found in these kind of matching tasks, that once you've started including between five and nine items for people to compare a test line to, their performance basically peaked and anything higher they would tend to get worse at. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here because we're at about 20 minutes. We will do a couple of demonstrations showing our limits of uh, short-term memory next time. And because our capacity is so limited, next time I am going to teach you one of the most powerful ways that you can exceed your short-term uh, memory capacity limits. I'm going to teach you a little bit about a phenomenon known as chunking. So I will talk some more about that on Monday and I will see you all later. Take care and have a great weekend.